Hey everyone, welcome to week 44. This is day four, Thursday. This is our ongoing atmosphere week. So yesterday something really cool happened and I think we made like a little discovery, but just by keeping the painting very loose, very open, I was like, yes, this is what I want to paint for this week. So today we're gonna try to bring some of that into uh, today's painting of Samu. So we'll see how we do. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day four, this is Thursday. This is our ongoing atmosphere week. And this week has honestly been a blast for me. Uh, yesterday, I made a ton of discoveries and it is so cool when, you know, a side of my painting, an aspect of my painting that has been kind of dormant can show up and remind me of really wonderful opportunities that painting is always willing to provide to me if I want to. I always say this, I always preface things by saying this if we want to, because I really do believe that this is a matter of choice. You know, it is a matter of choice, the fact that we, you know, close ourselves up from being impacted and influenced by alternative works of art, by alternative manners of solving painting. And it is us who decide if we want to close ourselves up and if we are comfortable with the things that we think we know. I was going to say with the things that we know, but it's best to put it with the things that we think we know. It is a choice to open ourselves up. It is a choice to feel vulnerable. It is a choice to say, I actually don't know much about this. I actually have to embrace my ignorance and say, I'm going to be willing to learn from this aspect that I previously had avoided. And I have to read and I have to observe and I have to reflect. That requires work. That is actually asking a lot from us. But if we are willing to take on that challenge, if we are willing to put in the time and if we are willing to maybe feel insecure while we look at other types of works of art, we are going to give ourselves the possibility to learn so, so much. We're not going to just find in art history examples that can justify the way we feel but what we're gonna find is a broader universe that can actually contest the way we feel, that can ask questions about who we are. I think that therein lies the value of art. Art is not really meant to be exclusive. I totally understand when we have a sensibility that we feel is not being echoed in the world that surrounds us, in the uh, societal circles that we move in. And I think that it is only human to feel embraced and it is only human to then feel like we should protect those sensibilities and art that are in accordance to our own. So many times we want to be fierce defenders of what we do because we actually feel like we found a home. We found like-minded people and we felt so alone for so long and then suddenly we feel that there are communities that respect and value those very same things that we respected and we valued. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why we choose to close ourselves up. We choose to reflect that rejection that we felt. So if we felt shunned by the art world and we suddenly found this niche, we suddenly found this tiny little place we can call home and we have friends in there, we tend to answer back to that initial rejection that we felt. We kind of feel that that is a way to achieve balance. And what I've always told people is that if you open yourself up, it's not going to be easy. You know, a ton of questions are going to be thrown your way. And many times it is going to be hard to answer those questions without ourselves questioning the very things that we thought we knew, the very fundamental aspects of our life. But that's the wonder of art. You know, it actually is helping us to shape ourselves. And I think that in essence, there's nothing wrong about that. Only wonderful things can happen when we embrace that. Why am I speaking about that? Because I think with yesterday's exercise, I kind of reminded myself that I can work with a brushier manner of painting. And I always told myself, I'm not really that painter. You know, sometimes I feel like I don't have the hand to be that painter. I don't have the sensibility to be that painter. Even though it's a running joke, I always consider myself as heavy handed. And I tried to paint in a way that would not display that heavy handedness. I mean, this is completely true. I had a teacher, Max Ginsburg, who is tied to this long tradition of brushy painters. He himself being an incredible brushy painter. By brushy painter, I mean that there are evident brush marks in the construction of a painting. And those very brush marks can actually configure very complex forms. 
I always saw Max's teachings as my goal in a way, but I also realized that they didn't come naturally to me. So I kind of avoided that way of working. And I think that even from the beginning, I was much more expressive. So I didn't have the elegance of those brushstrokes. And I kind of convinced myself that that is the person that I am. That is my sensibility. I'm never going to be able to work that way. But it is kind of nice when you sort of embrace it and you say, okay, you know, this painting is asking of me to navigate these abstract qualities of paint that are kind of exemplified by the essence of atmosphere, by the uh, definition of atmosphere. And, you know, there are moments through the painting that are asking of me to ground those brush marks and to then configure form to paint a, for example, yesterday, a portrait in shade to give really nice gesture to a coat. Those were some of the things that my painting was asking of me yesterday. And I just kind of organically landed in this manner of working where being brushy just felt like the right way to solve that particular painting. That coupled with the fact that I was using bigger brushes. And to be honest, they were some very nice rosemary synthetic brushes. I think there's a rosemary uh, bristle brush in there, like a bristle flat also. But in essence, they were brushes that could you know, hold a lot of paint and then deposit a lot of paint, leaving a very nice mark behind. So I kind of accepted that. I was like, okay, this is the nature of my tools. The character of these tools is actually enabling me to portray this atmosphere in a very sensuous way. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's the painter that I'm going to be today. I'm going to open myself up and I'm going to accept that even though this manner of painting has always made me feel insecure, I'm going to embrace it, I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to give it a shot because what am I going to lose? You know, I've always told people, like, what are you going to lose? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen that you do a bad painting? That's about it. And if you are in your home alone painting, like, I know it's going to hurt. I know it hurts us to actually acknowledge that we are not as good as we think we are. And we have the evidence for that when we look at a bad painting. But what else is wrong with it? Like, just that, that feeling of not being as good as we think we are, that feeling is probably going to accompany us as human beings for the rest of our lives. You know, every single day, we're probably going to encounter things in life that are asking of us to be a little bit better, you know, that are telling us, hey, you're probably not as good as you think you are. You can do a little bit better. So just try to be better today. So that's all this painting is asking of us. I can understand it. And I've been part of like, you know, bigger workshops. I was part of like a really big classroom as a student. And I've been part of big classrooms as a teacher. And I've taught workshops where there's dozens of people. When we are in a setup where people can actually look at our painting. And when we feel like we are the odd painter there, we're the ugly duckling, where every single person attending that workshop is better than us. Side note, I've had workshops where different people approach me in private because they ask to uh, speak to me in private, where they tell me, you know, I'm looking at everyone's work and I feel like I'm so behind and I feel like I'm the worst painter here. And then somebody approaches me and they say the exact same thing. So this sense of insecurity is just heightened by the fact that we're surrounded by other painters. And when we do a painting that we don't deem effective, that insecurity just bubbles up and it comes to the surface and it takes hold of us because we think that we're not only disappointing ourselves, we're actually showcasing to other people that we are not at their level. We are disappointing other people. So we're not only going to feel bad about ourselves, but we're also choosing, choosing, because again, this is a choice, we're choosing to understand ourselves as the weakest member of this painting community. So we are, in a way, disappointing all those other painters that are around us. That, I think, is the biggest fear when we open ourselves up and we say, I want to try this, but I'm probably going to fail and I don't want to deal with the pain that's associated with the failure. That, I think, is the biggest deterrent from us trying to open ourselves up and learn from things that we are ignorant about. And yesterday was a really cool thing for me because it showed me that, hey, you probably see yourself as heavy handed. And there's some truth to this. I mean, I can take a step back and I can objectively look at the way I work and I can say, I know myself. I know how sensitive my hands can be. I know who I am. I can recognize who I am. So there is some truth to that. 
But to be so harsh on myself and to say, yeah, because you're this insensitive oaf, uh, you should avoid trying to do brushier, more elegant painting. Elegant painting is in his sergeant painting. You know, that, that's what I associate with like brushy elegance. Um, so you're never going to paint like Max. You're certainly never going to paint like Sargent. So just avoid it. You know, do something else. Paint in some other way that's more congruous with the person that you are, with the sensibility that you have. That's the way I always convince myself that I should work. And it's so refreshing. It's so cool when you muster enough courage to say, let's give this a shot. What, what's going to happen? Like the painting is not going to come out. And who cares? Who gives a crap? Like if it doesn't come out, it doesn't come out. It's not a good painting. Tomorrow is going to be a new day and we'll give it another shot. We had a bad day or better yet, we're having an experience where we're learning a ton from it. Every single time we struggle, it's an opportunity to learn and to grow. So in a way, we have been gifted this opportunity, albeit painful, that is giving us a chance to learn about ourselves. And that's amazing. That is amazing. That is the most beautiful thing that painting can actually give you. It's not the ability to make gorgeous paintings so that everyone can adore you and call you a genius. That's nonsense. That's garbage. It's the chance to grow. It's the chance to grow every single day, to become a little bit more sensitive to who you are every single day in the hopes, and this is what I believe in, in the hopes that, you know, every single day you can be a little bit better. But better, not, not just a better painter. I mean, that's going to happen if you accompany the painting act with self-reflection. But what I believe in is that we can become better as a human being. That is something I deeply believe in. So yesterday I was very happy with what happened. And I realized it was my responsibility to take that lesson from yesterday and put it to test today. And the way I kind of told myself that I could do that was by saying, okay, my mark making can be elegant and can be charged with really interesting gesture and I can be sensitive enough. So instead of showcasing those things, instead of feeling like I deserve all this glory because I made this discovery about myself. No, I told myself, do a painting that speaks about those things, but do a painting that doesn't show off those things. Let the painting speak about your own sensibility, but don't try to do it through fireworks. I mean, you don't need it. You don't need all that attention. At least that's what I tell myself. I've never been keen on attention, so I'm always more comfortable just being kind of like in the shadows. So I told myself, okay, try to put those lessons to good use today and see what you could do. And the best kind of scenario that I came up with was to say, okay, I'm going to do a painting of Samu. I really want that painting to feel like Samu. I want to see if I can tap into the essence of Samu without over explaining who he is, without making it obvious, without making it too evident in the painting. So how can I do that? And what I found was that if I used his hoodie, if I used this sweater, as a shape, as a very abstract kind of framing shape, where one would suppose that the portrait is actually what the hoodie is framing. The hoodie is actually a device to just frame the portrait. That darker value, it's just a perfect excuse to frame a portrait, to behave almost like a bullseye and enclose this shape that we usually associate as the highest in the hierarchical scale of our painting. So what happens if this quote unquote framing device doesn't quite frame the uh, portrait? And what happens if that portrait is actually just kind of dissolving into the background? I really love that idea because it kind of goes against more traditional manners of working. And we can actually concentrate on those in upcoming weeks, we can actually do a week of value as a compositional device. I'm going to do that for an upcoming week. But anyways, so this example of Sargent, it's actually one of my favorite, favorite Sargent paintings. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It shows how you can use value as a compositional device. And obviously the choices that he's making are not arbitrary at all. So the fact that the portrait is in shade against, you know, a very light background, the same with the hand is actually something that Sargent designed in order to be able to tell a story. And because, you know, we've talked about this, our eyes, our human eyes just love contrast. They are going to go right there. And because there's this beautiful light 
you know, framing the contour of that portrait, we actually want to investigate what that light is and where it's coming and what it's describing. So that's kind of like the keyhole that we're peeping through. And we've been granted the ability to enter through this keyhole and then accompany the way in which light travels, describing this jumbled mess of uh, bed sheets. It is a perfect way to understand value as a device that is helping you not only travel your painting, but also describe forms in your painting. And again, you know, this is a genius, genius painting by Sargent. But for today, we're actually doing something that's quite the opposite. Instead of using value to highlight the forms that we want to describe, to guarantee that our eye is going to land in those centers of interest, we're saying, no, there's going to be this abstract shape that is the hoodie. And your eye is not really going to be directed towards that portrait because that portrait is actually affected so much by that light of that background that it kind of disappears. The portrait becomes, in a way, almost irrelevant. But that's the thing. It's a moment of the painting that seems to be invisible, but that we have to paint with such a degree of responsibility that it's beautiful. It's beautifully challenging to do that. It's like, how do I put so much effort into this moment of the painting in order for it to become invisible. <gasps> oh my God. I hope you guys sensed my gasping there, but that is one of the most amazing things in painting because it's kind of easy and predictable to just paint something that has a spotlight on it, right? You know, it's easy to say, hey, this is the most important thing in my painting. And you use a ton of abstract devices to point to that moment of the painting. You know, it almost feels like those devices are like neon arrows just asking you to go to that particular place. But it's also beautiful when we say, hey, this is a portrait where the portrait is actually not important. So what is the most important moment of the painting? Where is that bullseye in our painting? Like, what is the exclamation point in our painting? Perhaps it's not a bullseye, perhaps it's a little broader than that. And that is atmosphere. You know, we are speaking about air. We're speaking about the traveling of light. When we realize that air doesn't really sit still, you know, that we can't really compress air into just one little shape and say, yeah, this moment has air and the rest of it is just void. <laughs> the rest of it is just empty space. No, air actually affects everything in the painting. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. And I think that the painting that happened yesterday certainly gave me the strength I needed to paint the painting that I did today. And hopefully it will give me enough courage to approach tomorrow's painting also. Because what I want is for this to be this never ending source of energy. I mean, it's going to dry up eventually just because I'm going to start concentrating on another aspect of painting. And that's totally fine. Those moments that are probably going to occupy like different weeks in the upcoming months, they're going to help me put my attention on a very specific aspect of painting. And that's super cool. That's what I want. This never ending feeling of being uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, that's probably the worst way to sell painting. It's like, hey, paint because you never want to feel good about yourself ever. <laughs> but I think that that's magic. I think that that is, you know, the underlying truth of painting. And as soon as you embrace that this thing is never going to make you feel like you're this master of painting, you're going to acknowledge that there's never a goal, there's never a finish line, that you're just kind of hobbling through this race that never ends. Uh, <laughs> I know that may not sound attractive, but I think that's actually the most amazing thing in the world because as soon as you accept it, you realize it's never going to be about making a painting. It's never going to be about thinking that the finish line is a work of art. It's just about me stumbling my way through this path. And because this path doesn't end, this path is going to be my company for the rest of my life. You know, it's always going to be there. And I think that that's pretty cool. So anyways, that was... Atmosphere, day four, great lessons to be learned from yesterday, very cool lesson to be learned from today. Hopefully, that will make sense tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow's painting doesn't have to be incredible. It just has to be a painting that reflects upon these learnings. That's all it is. And if it turns out bad, then who cares? There's another week. And our project has a whole other year coming. So as we told you guys, this is two years. We are super ready to tackle, you know, December and 2021. And after that, we have no idea. 
we know that we're going to be exhausted by then. <laughs> so uh, we need to find courage and strength in every single painting that we can do. That's the whole idea behind this. So anyways, tomorrow we finish off this week, this atmosphere week. And I didn't say at the beginning, but for everyone that's living in the US, Happy Thanksgiving. It's an honor for us to be your company. If you're with your family, take care of everyone you love. If you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. You're with us. You know, we're always going to be here. So it's awesome. And we're grateful that you give us a chance to be your company. So a lot of love to you all. Be safe and don't eat too much. You're going to regret it tonight. So <laughs> big hugs from us. Have a great day. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.